The Tory plan to deport asylum seekers to Rwanda has generated opposition from a pretty broad coalition. It's, of course, no surprise human rights lawyers and activists oppose the policy, but the Tories may not have expected Prince Charles and the entire leadership of the Church of England to come out against the move. Yet in this difficult moment, it seems there is still one institution the Tories can rely on. This was Amal Rajan on the BBC. What does a humane and effective asylum policy look like? And among sovereign nations, which jurisdiction should be its ultimate arbiter? These are just two of the foundational questions to which the government's Rwanda policy was part of the answer. Public opinion is relatively evenly split and, of course, changes regularly. If the policy's aims include being tough in enforcing national social contracts, creating dividing lines with opponents and garnering positive headlines, it has achieved a modicum of success. If the aim is to deter asylum seekers or reduce channel crossings and pressure on our asylum system, it is just too early to know. Context matters here. Several other countries, from Australia to Denmark, are pursuing similar paths. Britain's deal with Rwanda was an agreement between two sovereign nations. At 28,526 last year, and possibly double that this year, there has been a sharp rise in the number of people arriving here by small boats across the channel. Last year, 75% of them were men under 40, 30% were Iranians. This year, the most common nationality is Afghan. These are, of course, desperate, destitute people undertaking huge risk in pursuit of sanctuary and freedom. Later today, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, will be making a statement to the Commons. And we're joined now by Therese Coffey, who is the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. That was, to my mind, a really bizarre introduction to an interview of a government minister. The the host basically made clear that he accepted all of her fundamental talking points before they even got going. Why do that? What is the point in doing that if you're supposed to be, you know, a journalist holding a politician to account? And here I'm I'm specifically talking about everything Amal Rajan said after he said context matters. I'm laying out the context. Because the context he highlighted was was frankly bizarre. Rajan emphasised that the policy is already being pursued by other countries from Australia to Denmark, he said. But he didn't mention the many, many more countries that aren't taking this step. Why compare ourselves only to the most hostile countries around? Rajan also stressed that Britain's deal with Rwanda was a deal between two sovereign nations. Now, that's true. It also seems to me completely irrelevant. It's the rights of asylum seekers that are in question here, not the governments making the deal. It's a bit like suggesting extraordinary rendition was permissible because Morocco or Egypt agreed to host America's torturees. It's completely besides the point. Then as more context, objectively sounding, this is the context, Rajan highlights the numbers coming over. But while 28,000 might sound like a big number, the missing context, the context he didn't mention, is how that compares to everyone else. A House of Commons briefing paper from March contains this chart. It shows Britain receives a comparatively tiny number of asylum applications compared to most of Europe, including in France, where we always complain the channel crossing migrants should apply. Why don't they apply there? We've got too many migrants here just apply in France. Well, guess what? They accept and they receive a lot more applications than we do. He also didn't mention that the number of asylum claims Britain grants is even more pathetic. You can see here we are way behind almost all major European countries. And as a proportion of our population, we accept half as many applicants as the EU average. So essentially there, you've got this context. I'm going to give here this context. And the context to me, that sounded like him saying, look, there is an exceptional problem. It calls for exceptional measures. And by the way, the government's plan isn't even that exceptional. We've got countries from Australia to Denmark doing it. Now, I think there's only about four countries doing it. So from Australia to Denmark potentially overstates it. And he's saying, look, exceptional exceptional measures call for exceptional responses. And this isn't even that exceptional anyway. Other countries are doing it. The complete opposite is the case. It's not a problem, but you can say it's a challenge. The challenge Britain has when it comes to asylum seekers is not exceptional. It's completely, completely normal. Our response is exceptional. It's exceptionally gruesome and brutal, and there are only about three other countries in the world considering it. Aaron, what did you think about uh, that introduction to to a government minister? As well? When I was listening to that live, I was kind of like, well, mm. if, he's, if he's given such a hostile introduction, I assume he's going to be interviewing like a, a, a lawyer on behalf of those asylum seekers, and that's why he's given such a, a one-sided introduction. But no, it was to speak to a government minister. Yeah, Amal Rajan is a very smart cookie. I mean, we both met him, I believe. Um, he's he's a very intelligent guy. He's he can be a very diligent, thorough journalist. So I, 
I think he has approached this story in this way for a very simple reason, which is, as a journalist, on controversial stories like this where the government is vulnerable, he's in the government's pocket. Now, why do I say that? Amal Rajan was once the editor of the independent newspaper owned by the Lebedevs. Uh, it was the only newspaper, I believe, in 2015 to tell its readers to vote for the coalition. Precisely how you do that isn't clear, uh, but it was a, a signal of support for austerity, and I think by many measures, the worst government this country's had in living memory. You've not just got Amal Rajan that then goes to the BBC Today programme. Before him, you have Sarah Sands. Like him, he works for Evgeny Lebedev. Uh, but rather than being at The Independent, of course, she was at The Evening Standard. And I find it particularly interesting that Lebedev has not one, but two of his most senior journalists go from his outlets to the BBC Today programme, one of the most important opinion-making, opinion-defining politics and current affairs shows in the UK today. And of course, Evgeny Lebedev, as we know, is a, a Tory lord. Now, this doesn't mean that Evgeny Lebedev is on the phone telling Amal Rajan what to say and what not to say, but I think that bizarre context, uh, as you've already highlighted, Michael, makes absolutely no sense unless it's situated within this broader understanding of the kinds of circles that Amal Rajan works in, the kinds of people he owes. Without Evgeny Lebedev, Amal Rajan is not where he is today, working at the BBC, having such a prodigious, precocious journalistic career at such a young age. So for me, this is a very classic example of a journalist representing the interests of people who, frankly, they owe. Uh, and I, I think that's a problem. And I think where people sort of get upset with our criticisms of the BBC, well, I'm sorry. I do have a criticism of a public service broadcaster which produces journalism that bad because we're paying for it. And it's awful. And frankly, it's public relations for only one side of the argument. People might say, look, he didn't say anything that was untrue. You know, you, Michael Walker, might have chosen a different set of facts as context for that interview, but why, why are yours any better than his? And I mean, how I'd respond is essentially to say, look, to be an impartial journalist in that situation. Now, what the government is is hoping from even journalists who's, you know, essentially support them is not for them to say, oh, it's brilliant to deport people to Rwanda. Like no one, no one's claiming it's brilliant. Pretty Patel isn't even claiming it's brilliant to deport people to Rwanda. The government talking point is, look, you might not like that we're deporting people to Rwanda before assessing their claims, but, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And what's your alternative? And, and so their challenge is, we've got this massive crisis. If you don't support this brutal policy, you're going to have to suggest another one. Now, everyone seems to close their eyes and, you know, put their fingers in their ears when anyone mentions, maybe we could have safe passages, maybe we could allow people to apply in France to come to Britain, that would stop them crossing the channel. But putting that to one side, the government's first job is to say we have a crisis here. The number of people trying to get to Britain is a, a broken asylum system, is representative of a broken asylum system, which is what we keep hearing from conservative politicians. There is a crisis, there is a crisis, that means desperate, extreme measures are warranted. It's not true. And yet that very objective sounding context, all of that was essentially intended to say, there is a crisis. Let's be clear, there is a crisis, right? That's the most important ideological job for the government done before the interview has even started. And it is, it's difficult to explain, you know, for, from, a, from a purely journalistic standpoint, which I suppose is why Aaron is going down those avenues, which I do find pretty persuasive in this context. All of us here at Navarra Media are working harder than ever to keep scrutinizing establishment politicians and the media barons who protect them. We don't have billionaire funders. We don't have advertising partnerships. We're funded entirely by you. If you've ever thought about supporting us, now's the time to go to navarramedia.com slash support and donate anything you can from just one pound per month. Defy the corporate media join our monthly supporters and help build our supporter base to 10,000 strong.